everyone, and welcome to Crosshairs, the show for gamers by... No, I think someone else has used that catchphrase. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's copyrighted or... We, yeah. can't, we can't use it regardless. So we'll, we'll, we need a tagline. What, what are we going to have? Uh, I, I don't know. What about gamey game 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 colon crosshairs? Thankfully... And, and we spell out colon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, enough about that. We have a pretty big show. We have Resistance 3. We have some stuff on Batman, Batman Arkham City. But for now, Cos, what are we going to do? We're going to be talking to Laura. In fact, she's actually going to be talking to us about what's going on in the world of video games news. So take it away, Laura. It's D-Day for Aussie gamers this week with federal, state and territory censorship ministers meeting in Adelaide this Friday to decide the fate of the long-awaited RE10 classification for games. Earlier this week, the New South Wales Attorney General stated his intention to abstain from the RE team vote, meaning that the classification cannot be passed this time around as it does require the unanimous agreement of all nine federal, state and territory representatives. All hope is not lost though, with Federal Minister for Home Affairs Brendan O'Connor hinting that he has a few possible options up his sleeve should the other ministers fail to agree to introduce RE team. The government is keeping quiet right now on what those options might be, but we'll find out soon enough come Friday. I will be reporting live from the Attorneys General meeting in Adelaide this Friday, so make sure you keep it tuned to GameSpot AU. In other Aussie news, Apple has dropped the prices of its Aussie apps, bringing the prices in line with those of the US. With the new pricing scheme, apps between 99 Aussie cents and 2.99 are exactly the same price in Australia as they are in the United States. Slightly higher tiered apps in the 3.99 to 9.99 price range still have a 50 cent price discrepancy, but overall it's pretty good news. Lastly, news for this week, according to Develop Magazine, EA will not be allowing Battlefield 3 to take up home on Steam, in the wake of the publisher opening up its own digital distribution service, Origin, which directly competes with Valve's platform. Two weeks ago, EA pulled Crisis 2 from Steam, saying Valve would not allow them to establish an ongoing relationship with users the way it saw fit. In news headlines this week, Uncharted 3 has proved to be the biggest beta the PlayStation 3 has ever seen, Ubisoft has confirmed its Uplay Passport online program, and finally, Final Fantasy XIII 2, a direct sequel to Final Fantasy XIII, has been confirmed for January 2012. That's it for Crosshairs News. Make sure you stay tuned to GameSpot AU. This week, the following titles have been rated by the Australian Classification Board. Slap on your helmet, call on your wingman, and get ready to feel the G's with news that the latest instalment in the long-running Ace Combat series, Ace Combat Assault Horizon, has powered through the rating barrier. This game takes air combat in a new direction, moving the camera closer to the action and taking pages out of books like the Modern Warfare series. Watch the skies when it buzzes the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 in October this year with a PG rating for mild violence. From a flying tin can to one that walks along the ground, get ready to turn green skinned orcs into fetching throw rugs or fine bloody mist. Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine puts you in the boots of Ultramarine Captain Titus, humanity's last hope when everything becomes war, and this third-person shooter melds firing big guns and swinging chainsaws. Rated MA15 Plus for strong science fiction violence, and will be popping its way onto the Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC in September 2011. And finally this week, if you just want to dunk, then get ready to boom shakalaka with NBA Jam On Fire Edition. This downloadable reboot of the arcade classic will feature a character hot swap option on the court, new razzle dazzle trick shots and an overhaul of the on fire system. Rated G for everybody, step up to the line when it shoots for the Xbox 360 and PS3 hoops in October this year. Okay, our first interview for this week is a look at Resistance 3. Obviously, the third game in the PlayStation 3 franchise. What number? That's three. On what PlayStation? In case you guys missed it. And by now, I think I'm a little bit lost with what's happening in the story. Cos, tell us about it. Well, thankfully, we talked to John Paquette, who was at E3, to talk to us a little bit about Resistance 3 and the storyline of that game. But a quick word of warning, there are some Resistance 2 spoilers in there, so if you haven't played it, you might want to block your ears for a bit. Spoilers. <laughs> Right from the beginning, you know, we knew what we wanted to make this a, a more human story, less military than the last two Resistance titles, um, and uh, and we wanted to, to kind of up the uh, the drama uh, in that sense. We knew that the the, the Chimera were going to be a, a big aspect of the game, um, and so we we said, okay, how can we make this uh, you know less military, but at the same time, you know, have you fighting a lot of Chimera? 
Um, so kind of the structure that we, we took with the game is, you know, we, we wanted the, the journey um, to include a bunch of stops along the way where we met different groups of survivors. Uh, so you could, you could see them as kind of, you know, little uh, squads of militaristic uh, people, but they're not military in that sense. They, they're just trying to survive. They're people like you and me. Um, so that's kind of the structure that, you know, we, we took with the, the story in the game. We had to sit down and say, okay, how if this happened to us, how how would we survive? You know, what what kinds of groups would we get into? And so we said, okay, there would probably be a group of people who would who would just fight back against the Chimera. They would be really angry, and they would you know they would want to mess with the Chimera at any opportunity. There would be another group of people that would kind of turn to their own faith. You know, whatever religion you know you're part of. You know, a lot of people in tough times kind of turn to that um, to deal with tragedy. Uh, so so we just kind of you know went from there and, and looked at a bunch of different you know groups of people um, and it was it was fairly easy to get that um, it, the harder part was narrowing it down to just a few we knew we wanted to end up in New York from from early on we knew that's where we wanted the the climax to be uh, so we decided on uh, Oklahoma fairly early uh, because the first part of the game we wanted to feel like home and and Oklahoma for a lot of Americans and probably people around the world represents that you know kind of breadbasket you know these are these are bred people who are just very home-like, you know. Um, so it's the first part of the game is very focused on family. And then from there, you know, we kind of drew a line from, from Oklahoma to New York and, and we saw different parts of, of the country that we could see along the way and we kind of matched those up with the groups of people that we wanted to, to uh, interact with. This is the first game that I've, the first resistance game that I've worked on. Uh, so when I started, uh, I had just played through Resistance 2, and I said, "Wait a second! They, you know, they killed the hero at the end of the last game, and and then I'm going to write the next game. What am I going to do? You know?" Uh, but now that I look back on it and I look at how the how Resistance 2 ended, it was a very natural progression for for Hale. I mean, the first two games uh, were were very clear storyline for him. It it was. When you look back on it, he had to die at the end of Resistance 2 in order for, for the world to survive. If he had survived, he would eventually turn fully Chimeran, and he could have been the worst enemy humans had ever seen. So, in a, in a sense, Joseph Capelli did the world a favor by killing Nathan Hale at the end. Joseph Capelli was the hero at the end of Resistance 2. So it made a lot of sense for, for us to continue uh, Capelli's story. So that was John Paquette talking about Resistance 3. Randy, can you explain to the audience why we had our hands up just then? Spoiler alert. That's the international signal for spoiler, isn't it? Uh, I've never heard that before. Oh, okay. Maybe I just made that up. Okay, what's our next interview, Cos? I don't know. You tell us. Okay, we're actually going to be talking about Batman Arkham City now. So that's the big game coming out of this year. And we spoke to Dax again a little bit more about what's happening with this new game, how difficult it's going to be playing as Batman, and much more. I know you work for Riddler. Please, don't hurt me. I'll tell you what you want to know. It's been a pleasure. When we set out to create um, Batman Arkham City, we knew that from a technical and a creative perspective, we were really going to have our work cut out. Um, our objective was never to really make a, a big game for the heck of making a big game. Our objective was to make the most detailed open world game that gamers have ever seen. So as Batman gliding through the streets, you can see the entire game world all laid out in front of you and it's open right from the beginning but for us the real beauty of the game comes when you drop down into the streets and you see the amazing detail that's there at street level that's when we know that I think we've created something really special so when it comes to really balancing the challenge for players when they're playing as Batman um, the good news from our perspective is that Batman is a mortal guy um, so balancing the challenge really comes down to what we give his enemies if Batman's in the streets surrounded by 15 guys who are carrying sledgehammers and baseball bats you know that Batman's going to be able to take those dudes down with his melee assault. But give one of them a, a machine gun or a shotgun or some sort of projectile weapon, that changes the situation completely. That guy can just stand back and he can kill Batman from a distance. So that's why we've given him all of these incredible sort of detective abilities to identify who's packing what sort of weaponry and also these stealth predator abilities to take these guys out silently um, and knock them out of the fight before they're going to cause too much damage. So the balance really comes down to giving Batman um, the abilities, equipping him with the skills to identify who's got weapons and who hasn't, and then target them first. 
I think the Predator gameplay that we created in Arkham Asylum really nailed that feeling of being Batman, striking in the shadows, achieving kind of these quick takedowns. We've approached that slightly differently in all combat scenarios for Arkham City so that you can take on um, those situations either with sort of just full brute force or you can adopt a stealth approach. So the, the lines between combat areas and, and stealth Predator areas is sort of blurred in Arkham City. When we come to design those areas, we've got to keep that in mind. We, we've got to really take on board the fact that the player might be approaching this in a number of different ways. So um, that really influences the way that our design team approaches the layout and the AI within those sections. We've designed Catwoman as a, an integral part of the core narrative structure. So um, her story is intertwined with Batman, and when you switch control between those players, you'll get a perspective of what's going on to the other character through the eyes of that that you're controlling. Playing as Catwoman um, in terms of navigation feels really, really different to Batman because obviously she doesn't have a cape. We've put a load of work into Batman's gliding abilities to navigate the world. She's got a much more kind of internet connection with the game world. Batman would fly over a building, she would climb up the side of it and sort of crawl along those rooftops. But also in combat, you know, Batman is this tank. When he hits, he hits hard, whereas she's much more athletic, much more feline. She moves quickly between uh, enemies and she sort of takes them down with kind of like this kind of sexy attitude as well. So uh, that's not something you get when you play as Batman. So that was Dax again talking to us about Batman Arkham City. We're going to go into simulation mode now and talk about F1 2011. Cause what do we have? Mm -hmm. We have senior producer Paul Gill on the show this week and he's talking to us a little bit about the last game and what improvements are made to this year's game. So take a look. Looking back, I think F1 2010 was a, was a, was a really big success. We were really uh, happy with, ha with what we achieved. It was far beyond what we expected it to be, really. Um, we tried to put so much content in there, and you know, as we were getting towards the end, we weren't quite sure how some of it was going to be taken, or maybe we didn't have time to polish it up quite as much as we would have liked. But I think the end result was that it was packed full of new fe features, and it really put F1 back on the map. I think it had kind of dwindled away a little bit, and people just almost thought they knew what the next one F F1 game would be like, even before it came out. So I think we've we've managed to shatter that uh, those perceptions but for F1 2011 we don't just want to we don't want to just carry on with that trend and then just do another update it's very important to us to not only polish up what we had there last year but introduce new features as well We've rewritten some of the, the car physics this year, and that's you can instantly feel the differences between the different setup compounds and even the, the, the two different types of tyre, and you can really feel the drop off now. Um, so, the main two models we've worked on are the tyre mod on suspension, also the aero, but you can really feel the car a lot more now. What's happening? You can feel the drop off, you can feel the weight transfer, you can actually correct the car this time around, you can attack the curbs, and it's not just going to spin out on you. So, all of those things now are transferring back into other areas of the game. So, you, you're delving into the car setup, or maybe there's a new performance part, and you can really feel the benefits of that now. Accessibility has been one of our focuses for sure. Um, we've tightened up the pad handling and that type of thing. We've re-evaluated re the driving assist system and how that works and how much sort of benefit that gives, get that gives to the car. But I think fundamentally this year, even though you would say that the car handling has moved on to a more simulation system, it's actually going to benefit all audiences because it's, it's more consistent, it's more predictable now. You can feel it a bit better. I think it's just tightened up all those areas all the way across the board. The F1 uh, crowd are quite vocal in, in, in their feedback and you know, you know, that really helps us in a way evaluate our, our, our feature priorities. Uh, we always knew that F1 2010 was, would be more of a single player experience. We had to write systems like practice and qualifying and just some fundamental things which make F1 unique. So um, that, that sort of you know, had to be done before you could concentrate on anything, anything else. So whilst F1 2010 was very much a single player experience with some multiplayer, the focus for F1 2011 you know, straight away would have been we need to, we need to incorporate um, multiplayer elements. We need to uh, encourage that competition between friends. But going back to the, the feedback from the forums, it is really easy for us to then pick you know, these are the most requested features or these are the areas we need to look at and increase the level of polish. This week sees Ubisoft taking the Call of Juarez franchise out of the Wild West and transporting it into a modern day setting with Call of Juarez, the cartel. Set during a bitter war between US law enforcement officers and the Mexican drug cartel, players get to choose one of three characters to fight as. The shtick here is each character has a different impact on the story. While it might appear from the outset that Ubisoft has just swapped out six shooters for semi-automatic handguns and horses for cars, there are still several ties to the previous Wild West games for fans to sink their teeth into. The second and only other game to be released this week is Earth Defense Force Insect Armageddon. While you can go up against the invading insects solo through the game's single player mode, the main focus here is on co-op, which supports up to six players online. That's all for this week's Shipping Out.
All right, so that was our look at F1 2011. And mm -hmm. before we finish the show off, Cos is going to tell us about the prizes you can win just mm -hmm. by going on the site. Cos, what are we giving away? So for this month's Ozpod competition, we are giving away a signed piece of Child of Eden artwork from Mizuguchi, which is kind of cool, as well as a couple of copies of the game. And we're also giving tickets away to the latest GameSpot Live event, which is featured for Deus Ex Human Revolution. That's right. You, yeah, that's right. You get to play the game a couple of days early, and mm. more importantly, get to hang out with us. Yes, and if, if you want to. I mean, there's also a game there, so up to you, really. Yeah, I'd rather hang out with us. So, how can people find out about these comps? All you got to do is go to www.gamespot.com.au forward slash comps, and you can enter there. Thank you very much, Cos, and that is it for this week of Crosshairs. We hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Wow! Wow! Like that. Stomping boots. All right, let's go. Cos reckons he has stomping boots on right now. Designed for <laughs>